Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to day two of uh, APRIA's uh, Investors Connection Forum. I'm Sibrid Shalsita, the CEO of APRIA, and I'm joining you from Singapore today. Uh, yesterday, we had a terrific 90-minute program where we discussed some of the exciting investment opportunities with a consensus from our speakers that investing in greener, uh, more inclusive, uh, resilient, and digital economies will take center stage going forward. And as a food for thought, uh, Professor Alex Edmonds uh, mentioned in his fireside chat uh, with um, uh, KKR uh, uh, MD uh, that uh, having purpose can lead to profits. So for today, we will build upon from yesterday's discussion by delving into how infrastructure can play a key role in the region's path to a robust growth and providing ample opportunities uh, for the investment community. Now, before hand is over to our keynote speaker for today, I would like to invite everyone to some of our events uh, through next month, uh, July. Uh, can we please... Uh, uh, show the slides okay so we have our opening new doors for investment uh, in asia pacific series on june 29th and this is focusing on the australian real estate market uh, shedding light on opportunities uh, tax and legal updates that you need to know uh, this investor webinar will be uh, conducted in English, but will also have a simultaneous English to Japanese translation. Now, we're also co-hosting an event with San Group on investing in Japan uh, real estate through Singapore structures, and that will be held on July 8th. Now, on July 15th, we're doing a hybrid event uh, together with SSNC on uh, emerging opportunities in today's changing landscape. So more details can be found on our website. Now, lastly, I would like to acknowledge our planning committee for this forum, uh, whose advice and perspectives have been invaluable in shaping and putting together uh, the forum's program uh, over the last few days. Uh, and I'd like to uh, Thank them, Martin Sierra of Bank of America, Brian Salder Gill of KKR, Kay Rochelle of HDFC Property Ventures, Milton Liu of AEW Asia, Shen Wa Shen of I Squared Capital. So thank you very much. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce our uh, keynote speaker for this afternoon. Okay. Uh, I'd like, I'm pleased to introduce Anita George who is Executive Vice President, Deputy Head of CDPQ Global, CDPQ India. So over to you, Anita. Thank you very much, Secret. Uh, and thank you to Apriya for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to speak to all of you today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. <clears throat> These are historic moments in the evolution of our world, and we have once in a lifetime, I would say, an opportunity to rejuvenate, reinvest, and to possibly transform ourselves and make a better world. This moment, I feel, is one such historic moment that all of us can take advantage of. The Corona pandemic has given us really a cause for pause. As many of you have seen and heard and experienced, it has affected all countries in many different ways. And actually it has exposed our frailties and it has underscored the deep inequalities both within countries as well as between countries. Ironically, this pandemic is also the great equalizer. Why do I say this? Because I strongly believe that this pandemic will not end until everyone has access to the vaccine. And we need a universal approach towards making sure that this access is provided to everybody 
to have or to even hope for a full broad-based global economic recovery. So um, I thought what I would share with you today is the example of CDPQ, Caisse de Dépôt Placement du Québec. We are Canada's second largest pension fund manager. And our journey and our experience through these past few years is one that speaks to, I think, uh, what is happening globally as well as in Asia and in emerging markets. I'll also touch on India and the opportunities that we see here. Um, and I'll start by sharing an, an small presentation to give you some background. So let me just get that up. Okay, so I'm going to enlarge in the presentation. I think that gives us um, I hope everybody can see this. So in this uh, oops. okay, so here we have a very pictorial description of CDPQ. We manage funds for 42 public and parapublic organizations, both pension plans as well as insurance plans. Uh, our goal is to really generate stable, solid returns for our pensioners, who are the 6 million Quebecers. And for us, front and center is doing these investments with sustainability and a long-term view. Uh, we also have a dual mandate in that not only do we have to raise um, and to make investments that provide reliable returns for our pensioners, but also we contribute towards the economic development of Quebec. Now, wearing this economic development hat has actually given us an approach which runs deep in our DNA of looking at the development impact that our investments have regardless of where we invest around the world. And as you see with net assets of 365 billion Canadian dollars, uh, we are present in 12 different locations, which um, covers almost every continent in the world. And our um, objective is really to benefit from this diversified source of return and create value through uh, very proactive post-investment management and assess risks very thoroughly. Uh, the Quebec economy, we leverage our advantages in Quebec to generate returns and contribute towards a sustainable economy. I think Quebec is an excellent example of how you can build sustainability at very different levels from the very large corporates to the small and medium enterprises as well. Our worldwide presence is really integral to our strategy and we aim uh, to really build that worldwide presence through partnerships and selecting the right partners, working with them over the long term is part of our approach to investments. Um, the technology trends, which had already started before the pandemic, has now got even more, I, I would say, accelerated and the impact that has affects, it's, it's ubiquitous. It affects every single sector, <clears throat> both in terms of the nature of the business as well as operations. Last but not the least is our focus on stewardship investing. So holding ourselves to a high standard in terms of generating and transitioning towards a low carbon economy and at the same time, really bringing ESG matters front and center to our investment approach. We also work not just by ourselves, but collectively 
uh, with other investors, and I will cover that in a minute. So in terms of uh, investing in the transition, CDPQ actually started many years ago. In fact, back in 2006, we were originally um, working with the UN uh, principles of responsible investment. So we've had within our approach to investment, a concern for responsible investment throughout. Uh, in 2017, we actually made an explicit uh, commitment, which we disclosed publicly, to increase our low carbon investments by 80% between 2017 and 2020, and to reduce our carbon intensity per dollar invested by 25% between 2017 and 2025. And we said that by doing this ourselves and holding ourselves to a higher standard, we also hope to play a leadership role and bring in other investors into um, also following um, a low carbon investment approach. As you can see uh, from this graph, our portfolio companies uh, have actually helped us to achieve this objective of new green investments where we've uh, exceeded our targets and um, delivered $36 billion worth of new investments. Some of our portfolio companies are also developing and building assets, especially in the renewable energy sector, which are now being sold to others who want to come in and take um, more brownfield risks. So this is a role that some of our portfolio companies have also been playing over time. These are some of the examples, as you can see, on low carbon investments. And uh, we have actually learned through our global uh, involvement across continents that renewable energy, um, EV and charging stations, um, energy efficiency, uh, offshore as well as onshore um, wind. These are all different areas where CDPQ has been able through its investments to contribute significantly towards uh, lowering the uh, carbon intensity of our portfolio and of the countries that we operate in. So uh, when we look at these, um, the trend globally, what we are seeing is that there are many long-term institutional investors who have joined us and are committing to similar, um, similar targets of not just um, lowering the carbon intensity, but also um, also uh, really uh, in terms of uh, increasing the green investments that we are making globally. Uh, we have a partnership with 14 uh, institutional investors called the Investor Leadership Network. And collectively, we have said that we will focus on climate change. So we uh, have agreed to have targets to disclose them publicly and also to have third party verification of what we are delivering year on year. Uh, this group of 14 have $5 trillion under management, and therefore the voice that we have and the efforts that we are making is actually expanding quite rapidly to include a larger universe of institutional investors. And this is a very significant trend that we are seeing across the globe. We also have come together with the eight Canadian um, pension funds, uh, we call ourselves the Maple 8 Group. And collectively, again, we've put a lot of emphasis, not just on the E of uh, environment, where climate, of course, plays a big role. Biodiversity is something else that we are looking at. 
we also focus on the S uh, just in terms of diversity and inclusion. We have made a big effort firstly within our own organization to make sure that we have a diverse and equal opportunity organization as well as collectively through the ILN platform through the Maple Ape platform to make sure that we promote diversity for us within ourselves as well as in the companies in the portfolio companies where we are investing so recently for the listed uh, companies, we have uh, actually said that there should be 30% diversity and we have the means to influence how these companies um, are uh, voting on their boards, depending on the kind of um, milestones and targets that they have agreed to improve and uh, promote diversity as well as um, carbon intensity and transitioning towards a low carbon um, economy. Uh, the third area, of course, is governance, which is very critical and important. It's both from a risk point of view as well as from an opportunity point of view. We feel that um, focusing on governance is critical to really have the kind of investments which will generate the yields that we are looking for, which are reliable. And that reliability really comes from following uh, good governance practices. Uh, we have deepened our position both on climate issues as well as on um, diversity and inclusion. Uh, we recently launched a fund called 25 to the power of three which is really providing access to capital for those small and medium enterprises in Canada that are uh, following uh, three layers of diversity at the management level, at the board level, and at the shareholder level. And that's where the name 25 to the power of three comes from. <clears throat> In addition to the physical assets for us, uh, today CDPQ is the third largest investor in uh, institutional investor in infrastructure. And we are very proud of that because we feel that infrastructure is really the gold for us in terms of economic recovery. And as you've seen, this is not just uh, um, something that we are following, but it's become sort of the um, approach that a lot of governments are taking in terms of economic recovery post pandemic. Uh, if you followed the recent G7 discussions, for example, the Build Back Better World or B3W uh, is also looking at really promoting economic growth and greater parity between emerging countries and developed countries through bringing in more sustainable infrastructure investments. And uh, CDPQ, as I had shown in the slides earlier, has really focused not just on renewable energies, EVs, but also in areas such as energy efficiency, uh, where we see a lot of opportunity to actually move our investor, investee companies, as well as the economies in which we operate more towards a low carbon uh, future. Here, I would like to mention the important role of Asia, because if you look at the uh, large emitters in the world, uh, we have the US, China, India, Indonesia, so a large, um, percentage which is focused in Asia. But the way I see it, I really see that as an opportunity. So if we look at, for example, the real estate sector, uh, in many of the emerging Asian markets, 50% of the buildings that have to be built are yet to be built. That really gives us an opportunity to follow um, green practices and again, from a long term point of view and given the technologies that are now more prevalent and more easily available, it is 
very possible to really make that concerted shift towards building better, building green buildings, et cetera. The financing, um, if you look at the total pool of long-term institutional investors, both sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, insurance funds, as well as family offices, which have started playing a significant role also, uh, we have about $150 trillion. And the one thing I can say is that a lot of uh, countries are really punching below their weight in the sense that they don't have as much access to this pool of long-term capital as what they contribute to the global GDP. And therefore there is, I think, a very good opportunity for countries in Asia, especially those following a low carbon approach that can tap into this long-term pool of capital that's available. And this is constructive capital, as we say in CDPQ, as it is building um, alongside partners for the long term. And therefore, it's not uh, subject to variations in or volatility in the economy from quarter to quarter. This is more long term capital, which can therefore it's very suitable to climate change related investments and making sure that we put ESG front and center and helping the companies that we invest with to really grow in terms of their ESG approach and um, mainstreaming it into their everyday operations. Uh, we, we, I would say, are very uh, excited by the opportunities that are presented with the fact that most of the world is turning towards this green approach. Uh, we have the COP26 coming up in November, and already there is a lot of consensus being built in terms of not just having financial reporting, but also um, ESG reporting, which is measurable, reportable, verifiable. And this is going to become more the norm than the exception. So I think it's it's a really presents for Asia a very good opportunity. And the last point that I would like to focus on is India. Uh, we have had a very harrowing experience of the COVID wave two. However, I'm happy to say that uh, the uh, there have been now steps taken both towards increasing vaccination as well as uh, uh, the lockdowns, the selective lockdowns that have taken place, which have brought down the numbers, particularly in the large metros. However, there is still uh, work to be done. And I think what we should really learn from the COVID too is what not to do and how to be much better prepared for the third wave, which will inevitably come. And so I think most of the businesses have responded very well. Uh, what often happens when you have such harrowing um, experiences is that people step up. So governments, businesses, as well as individual citizens stepped up in a way that I've never seen before, which has actually brought in uh, much quicker responses and the ability for people to now get back to um, economic activity and getting back onto their feet. Uh, preparing for the third wave, I think uh, one thing that India as well as many other economies have learned is the need to again progress vaccination very proactively. And when we look at the countries that have managed to do that, you can see that economic activity has come back more forcefully in those economies. Secondly, I would say the um, ability to really uh, make sure that um, trends are detected early on and acted upon early on. 
is is very important and we have many good examples of countries who've done that and been able to contain the impact of the subsequent waves of covid um, and and that's really a strong hope we have in india just looking at it from an economic point of view actually the economic activity was worse affected in the first wave in india than in the second wave Having said that, I think we need to watch for another few quarters to see uh, what the ultimate impact will be on the economy. There are, of course, uh, sectors which have lost and sectors which are doing much better. And uh, we hope that the acceleration of uh, digitization, access to um, digital um, information for a wider range of the population is something which is being um, looked at very seriously. And again, I would say it's happening not just at the government level, but also within the private sector. And the third and th aspect that I would like to um, highlight in India is the possibility for uh, both infrastructure and real estate investments. So India had come out with an infrastructure uh, plan of 1.7 trillion, of which a quarter is focused on renewable energy and the energy transition. So this is something which is being pushed very, um, um, very, very much <clears throat> in India. And one of the steps that the Indian government has taken is to provide uh, long-term capital investors like sovereign wealth funds and pension funds uh, to have uh, tax uh, reduction in the infrastructure equity as well as debt investments. And we see that that is already having a pickup uh, in terms of greater investments in these sectors. So we hope that having learned from the uh, horrible experience of COVID-2, that both from an economic point of view, as well as from a health infrastructure and ability to respond uh, will uh, improve uh, and, and deliver the results that we are looking for. Thank you all very much for your patient hearing and uh, I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Over to you, Sigrid. Thank you again for inviting me. All right, so thank you so much, uh, Anita. There are just so many takeaways, at least even for me, you know, from your presentation. Uh, we're very pleased to hear that CDPQ's uh, low carbon investment approach, uh, focusing on climate change with targets that are disclosed, strong governance, this really commendable uh, investment principles that uh, can really set the tone for many of our players in, in the industry. Uh, I like how you frame that infrastructure is gold. Uh, completely agree with that. And when we combine that with real estate, both are so important in, in supporting economic recovery, especially in Asia. Uh, and uh, completely agree again that we have an exceptional opportunity. All of us here, hopefully our listeners uh, uh, can appreciate this. We have an exceptional opportunity uh, in our community to pool constructive capital, you know, and invest them in, in building a greener and more inclusive uh, build, uh, environment. And uh, but all of this, of course, will be reliant on having a uh, an effective vaccination policy. Uh, as you say, we got to have the vaccination to be rolled out so we can all resume uh, the economic activity that we're so used to in the past. And uh, we're so looking forward to having it uh, again in the future, very near future. So great stuff, uh, Anita. So thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to remind the audience, you have an opportunity to ask our speakers for today. Uh, but uh, right now, I don't see any questions for Anita. But if there is any, feel free to send them to us. And we will be glad to forward them to, to Anita. OK, thank you so much again, Anita. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So 
Bye. So we, we have organized for the next session a uh, panel discussion on how infrastructure is integral uh, into uh, sustaining the region's dynamic growth. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Simon Cow, who's partner of King and Spalding. And let Simon uh, introduce his uh, panelists. And uh, can I have uh, Simon and everyone else join me? I'll watch over to you, Simon. Hi, Sigrid. It's Simon Cowlett here. Can you see me okay and hear me okay? Yes, yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, thanks very much for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Simon Cowlett. I'm a partner with uh, King and Spalding, um, an international law firm based in uh, Singapore. Um, I've been advising on the development, acquisition and disposal of in infrastructure projects in the region for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, and today I'm joined by uh, two uh, investors that are active um, in Asia uh, infrastructure, uh, Mr. Pratik uh, Maheshwari. Uh, who is Managing Director and, and Head of Owners uh, Infrastructure for, for Asia, and Mr. Rohit Nanda, uh, Head of Asia Principal Investments at uh, SMBC. Uh, so um, today we're going to be focusing on um, growth and opportunities in uh, Asian infrastructure. And I might just pass to my uh, fellow panelists uh, for them to make a brief introduction um, of themselves and their organizations. Um, and also uh, to share a few uh, thoughts, a few initial thoughts on uh, where they see the opportunities for infrastructure investment in the region. So, uh, Pratik, can I hand over to you? Sure. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. I can see shaking heads, so I assume that's a yes. Okay, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, uh, depending on where you're based. Pratik Maheshwari here. I joined OMAS a couple of years ago uh, from uh, another infrastructure fund called Global Infrastructure Partners. As uh, Simon introduced, I look after our infrastructure investments in Asia. A very quick introduction about OMAS. So OMAS basically represents the Municipal Employees Retirement System of Ontario, We're about half a million people. Uh, we're about $105 billion of assets under management, of which a quarter of that is in infrastructure. So give or take $25, $26 billion of assets under management uh, within the infrastructure space. We entered Asia a few years ago, and the reason behind that was that we saw the structural shifts happening where the growth is going to come from East. And that's the growth which is not a few years growth, but for decades to come. And what attracted us about Asia was the fundamental and the structural growth, which we were seeing, which was based on demographics, which was based on uh, a rising population, uh, growing middle class urbanization, which all leads to a need for either an upgrading or, uh, or new infrastructure. And where we felt long-term institutional investors like ours can really add value to that growth. And hence, that was the reason we set up our office in Singapore in uh, 2018. And it was not just an infrastructure outpost. We also have presence from our real estate, private equity, as well as capital markets teams in Singapore. But infrastructure definitely is a strong focus in this part of the world. And we've grown our teams in Singapore from our original team of six people. We are now 30, going to about 40 people by the end of this year. And very excited to be part of this panel to speak about the growth opportunities we see in this region. Uh, over to you, Rohit. Thank you, Pratik. Am I audible? Yep. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Rohit Nanda, and I'm with SMBC, uh, which is uh, Sumitra Mitsui uh, Banking Corporation. It's a Japanese commercial bank. Uh, my mandate is to you know deploy a bank's balance sheet capital into various infrastructure companies in the region. You know, 
uh, geography wise i can look at opportunities starting from india all the way in downhill uh, australia uh, typical yeah. investment holding period would be anywhere between four to uh, six years and the way we have been set up is uh, we are kind of segregated from the typical services that smbc offers uh, which is uh, uh, banking uh, in summary i am the small p uh, within this uh, focusing on infrastructure uh, within this uh, uh, japanese commercial bank uh, we infrastructure has been an interesting asset class uh, for us all across the bank uh, historically the bank has been very very active in providing that and equity is uh, a new initiative that is deploying equity into various infrastructure companies and uh, we are generally very bullish about the opportunities uh, that we come across in certain markets uh, within the asia region uh, just to give you some context uh, you know based on my understanding in excess of 500 billion dollar of private capital was deployed into uh, infrastructure in the last year of which close to 50 percent was deployed uh, to APAC. So in summary, very bullish in infrastructure, and uh, we continue to look for opportunities uh, with the right within the right risk reward spectrum. Back to you, Simon. Uh, thanks, Rohit. So I was listening to our um, um, to Anita Marangoli George from CDPQ talking about the uh, context. Um, in which uh, CDBQ is operating, uh, talking about uh, decarbonization, uh, ESG, uh, digital infrastructure, uh, and um, investing in infrastructure um, as we spend our way out of this pandemic in a way that, that achieves our, our, our green goals. Um, and I think those are the topics that many of our infrastructure investor clients are talking about. Um, when, when you guys look at Asia and you look at the universe of investable opportunities in Asia by sector, um, in which sectors are you finding um, the best opportunities uh, over, the, over the coming years? Uh, Pratik? Yeah, so look, um, it's, a, it's a great question, Simon, and, and I heard Anita speak as well. I mean. ESG uh, decarbonization, or what I would call it as the whole sustainability side of things is a very relevant and a very pertinent theme which all investors are looking at. And it's I don't think it's just an Asia theme, it's a global theme for all investors, including ourselves. So I would point out that we do see some good opportunities coming from the entire spectrum of energy transition, whether it links into the power sector or whether there's a linkage with the transport sector. So anything to do with renewable energy, renewable generation, firm dispatchable power, EV, those are areas where uh, we feel we can get some good opportunities from Asia. And and there is a, there's an important reason behind it because Asia needs to grow as well. The overall consumption is gonna grow at five, 6% compared to some other parts of the world. So in addition to decarbonizing what they have on the ground, they need to figure out how do they decarbonize the growth, which is going to come from, because many of the countries have decided that the incremental growth is not really going to come from fossil fuels. And hence, that is going to lead to a large investment requirement, not just decarbonizing what is there existing from a, from a power wise or from a transportation perspective, but even for the growth. So that is one area. Uh, the other area of focus for us, which we are closely uh, monitoring, is around the digital infrastructure. So anything to do with the communication side of things, uh, anything to do with fiber, towers, those are areas, again, a global focus for us. But within Asia, as we see uh, a rising middle class, uh, a growing propensity to own smartphones, an increasing requirement and dependency on data consumption, we see uh, the digital and the communication infrastructure uh, and a requirement for incremental um, investments onto that field as, as a very important field for us for investments as well. And lastly, I would say while transportation side of things has taken a battering, uh, especially during the COVID times, we still believe that uh, there is a strong GDP play, which is yet to come uh, in, in Asia over the next decade, two decades, and hence, you know, things around fundamental transportation infrastructure, we believe still remain strong. The fundamental thesis around them still remain strong. 
And whilst it's taken a little bit of a blip over the last year or so due to COVID because of mobility restrictions, I think there are some good assets uh, and, and good investments to be done in that field as well. Now, Rohit, anything you'd add from a sector perspective? Sure. Uh, I, I kind of echo what uh, uh, Pratik mentioned. And, uh, ESG is becoming very, very uh, relevant in today's uh, space. Uh, and we simply can't ignore it. Uh, but what what I would like to highlight here is ESG is not a new concept. You know, uh, the, the, the E was always there you know, uh, for the past 10, 15 years. Uh, the G was always there, you know, the governance part. Uh, what is getting more uh, important uh, over the past two years is the social aspect. You know? And this is something which all the stakeholders in this part of the world, uh, they need to understand. You know, the, the faster they're able to understand, the better it is uh, you know, for everyone. And that includes uh, you know, money managers like ourselves as well. Uh, the digital infra, like Pratik uh, mentioned, the renewables, uh, you know, like he mentioned. Uh, one thing which I would li like uh, to add is uh, EV, EV electric vehicle is becoming more uh, you know, attractive to us. Uh, not the entire value chain, but there are certain parts of the EV value chain which is uh, which makes sense from an infrastructure uh, uh, play. Uh, certain countries have uh, come up with policy policy initiatives, uh, which is uh, you know, seen very positively by investors like us. Uh, the other sector, which is still early days as far as Asia or emerging Asia is concerned, is uh, hydrogen. But uh, this is something which is definitely in our radar, and we will continue to monitor and watch this space as we move ahead in time. Back to you, Simon. Thanks, Rohit. Um, now, I'm going to be a bit controversial and, and disagree with something that you just said, Rohit. I agree in some respects that E has always been on the agenda, but in Asia, we've kind of had um, a, a system where in, in, in the US and Europe, there's a certain approach to uh, carbon intensive investment. And in particular, I'm thinking about coal fired power, where in Asia, there's been the, the, the GDP exception, where for non-OECD countries, uh, banks have been, particularly Japanese banks and uh, trading companies have been willing to, to put money into coal fired power, um, clean, you know, ultra supercritical technology and uh, e has always been important, but over the last year or two, we've, at least on our side, seen a, a seismic shift in the way that lenders are thinking about this and um, equity investors are thinking about this, a big push towards uh, solar and wind, um, offshore wind, um, and then some of the, the newer energy transition um, investments, some of, some of the things that uh, Pratik mentioned, like firm power, so, so adding battery storage together with um, solar and, and wind. Um, a little bit further down the track, folks are always also starting to think about um, hydrogen um, as as a new uh, technology. With initial investments in the U.S., Saudi, um, one had a, a setback this week in in Australia. Um, from a an energy transition um, perspective, because I think this is a a real sea change in Asia. Uh, where we're seeing um, clients exit um, more carbon intensive investments and um, really try and get into um, greener investments. Uh, folks are having challenges. Um, the, 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 the local projects are usually local PPAs, local financing, small projects, hard to do that on an institutional basis. Um, there are some platforms in India. It's a, it's a very um, mature market. Uh, but in, in Southeast Asia, the, it's a patchwork quilt of, of countries and, and regulations and um, the, the, the universe of investable opportunities isn't, isn't huge. So, so just digging down on um, energy transition for, for a minute, uh, Pratik and Rohit, any thoughts on the sort of specific opportunities or specific challenges that you're seeing? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> see, uh, Asia is very diverse, uh, you know, uh, and each country's uh, come with its own unique set of challenges and opportunities. So, uh, not all the renewable or the green sectors might be 
attractive you know, in, 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 a, in a specific country, uh, which is why we have to spend a lot of time and energy trying to understand the local conditions, the local situations, and that involves uh, uh, items such as policy, you know, uh, the legal enforceability, the overall bankability, you know, the sustainability of that specific uh, you know, uh, sub-renewable sector, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the energy mix, uh, of the of the country so all of these uh, factors uh, definitely come into the play before we make up our mind that okay we want to only focus on hypothetically uh, solar in india or uh, solar in vietnam you know. uh, we wouldn't want be we wouldn't be comfortable trying to do uh, solar in uh, indonesia so it's, it's very subjective and uh, it's not there is no straight answer to your question but uh, Moving on to the next uh, topic uh, that you touched upon, you know, are there any uh, specific sectors within the renewable area that I'm focusing? Uh, it still continues to be solar, you know, uh, which which has been the case for me over the past. Years. And uh, most of the deals that we are evaluating happens to be in uh, two uh, countries, uh, that is India and uh, Vietnam. Vietnam uh, has become a hot hotbed for uh, various renewable projects over the past three to four years and uh, besides these two markets uh, solar in indonesia is coming up uh, slowly but the policy discussion has been ongoing for the past four to five years i don't want to sound politically incorrect but uh, considering the potential that the country has to offer uh, it's moving at a slower pace and um, or the team out here is eagerly waiting for opportunities uh, in the solar uh, space uh, in Indonesia. Over to you, Prati. Yeah, look, I'll, uh, I'll agree with most of the things. And Simon, the, the points you mentioned, because Asia is large. I mean, India is kind in its own league, given the size of its economy, given the population, and given the early start they had towards the regulatory frameworks and putting in place uh, the bankability of the PPAs, and putting in place a power policy uh, for renewables and now expanding that power policy into storage solutions. I think if you look at Southeast Asian countries, some of them are coming uh, up. It is the way I look at it. There's a genuine desire to see how they can move their economies away from fossil fuel, whether it's a combination of international investors, pressure, or uh, Paris framework, or just a general uh, trend towards which the, the global economies are moving. So like an example is Indonesia's recent announcement on, uh, on kind of uh, no new coal-fired plants for its uh, incumbent uh, national utility going forward. Um, but, you know, having said that, I think there are challenges and there are challenges even in India, if you look at it uh, with the way the tariffs have fluctuated uh, all the way down to two rupees. And then there have been delays in terms of uh, signing of some of the PPAs, etc. But I would say these are these are things uh, we need to navigate uh, and, uh, you know, get comfortable in terms of uh, whether it's a time delay or whether it's, there's some fundamental problem behind it. Uh, so far, uh, we've not seen things, at least when we look at India, we've not seen things which are absolute deal breakers. Uh, you know, there are these ups and downs which happen as part of any process. Southeast Asia, you know, you touched upon an interesting point that individually each of the countries and projects are small. Uh, and so how do you get comfortable going down a route of very small projects? And that's where the approach towards Southeast Asia generally has been, whether there could be a platform play where you can combine uh, a few countries and uh, and operate on a, on that kind of a, a level where it provides you with that scale and where it provides you with that kind of an approach where you're diversified across a few countries. So that's the way we're looking at Southeast Asia. Got it. And I think uh, Anita also touched on on this theme, and we're probably all sick of talking about it, um, and that's, that's COVID. Um, uh, I sit in Singapore, uh, we're still in lockdown. Uh, many of our uh, participants on the conference might be uh, in the region uh, locally. There are many, many countries that are um, really struggling with the, with the, with the pandemic um, and it's a challenging situation, but uh, we're, we're learning to, to live with travel restrictions and lockdowns. 
uh, my colleagues in the US and, and Europe are, are getting back to work. Um, so, so for the advisor market, uh, folks in New York are, are back in the office, um, which, which seems a, a while away for us. Um, from an investment perspective, um, an inst institutional investment perspective, how has COVID impacted the way that you're uh, sourcing uh, deals and, and closing deals? Um, on our side, we're seeing a, a healthy pipeline, uh, but things are taking a lot longer. Um, a lot of the deals are cross-border or cross-cultural, um, and there's a trust element to uh, the sourcing and closing a deal that um, is hard to replicate um, online. Um, so I'll pause there. Um, Rohit, what is your, what, what's been your experience on the investment side? Look, uh, we have made peace, uh, peace uh, with the restrictions, you know, that has come or become part of our life. You know, the first three or four months was difficult, uh, but then again, uh, the intention was to navigate uh, through the system. And you touched upon an important uh, part, which I fully subscribe to. You know, uh, emerging Asia, it's, it's a relationship uh, driven uh, market. You know? uh, it takes a lot of time, uh, energy and uh, personal interaction to build a relationship with the founder you know, who might be located in Vietnam or Indonesia or uh, uh, Philippines. And that, that's just the beginning. You know, you have to continue, you know, building on to that uh, relationship. You have to nurture it, you know, and then hopefully, you know, uh, you harvest the fruits uh, at exit, you know. So all of this is uh, getting impacted in some form or shape. Uh, the only route that is left uh, for us is what we are doing today, you know, online. Uh, are we, have we come to a standstill? No, uh, things are moving on and uh, I do agree. We also have a healthy pipeline, uh, but that is, that is something the facial, uh, the personal interaction, which, uh, which uh, I, I miss. Uh, the other aspect is, uh, with regards to conducting due diligence, you know, that was also, uh, you know, and, and, tricky part for us because we just completed uh, a detailed due diligence on uh, a potential investment into a renewable platform in one of the countries. <clears throat> and uh, historically, uh, we would definitely go and uh, walk around the site, you know, the operating plans, you know, before you know, putting capital there. And we couldn't do that. We tried uh, a lot. We waited for a couple, couple of months, three months, and no, no solution. And finally, ended up uh, buying drones and made them fly on top of uh, you know, the plant sites. So, so the point I'm trying to make here is you have to come up with you know some kind of innovative, if not innovative, uh, slightly different methodology or mechanism to you know to navigate through the system. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's life. You know, that's life for most of the stakeholders in this part of the world. The final part is with regards to asset management, you know, uh, again, one and a half years back, that would be, again, a lot of uh, personal interaction. Uh, when you are sitting in the board, you have to, you have to go and attend all the AGMs, you know, the board meetings, notwithstanding uh, that uh, you would be still in a position to go and visit your industry companies and, and take stock of uh, what's happening you know, on the ground. So that has also been impacted and, and the only I think left out is, you know, to increase the number of phone calls and increase the number of uh, you know, Zoom or team meetings uh, with, with various uh, counterparties. And, and Pratik, I guess, I, I guess this is topical for you, Pratik, you're sitting in London, but you want to be here. How, how are the prospects for you? Yeah, look, they were looking. Uh, they were looking pretty good until, uh, say, about uh, March end or something, when there's just another wave which swept through Asia. Uh, if you look at uh, most of the large countries are suffering now, whether it's a lack of vaccination or whatever the reason is, we can keep on debating. Um, so it remains to be seen uh, whether it's end of the year, early next year, when things stabilize a little bit. But coming back, I think to the point on. Uh, how deals were being done, pipeline, etc. Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, Rohit made that point adjustment with the reality is the right word. But uh, I would say it is definitely not the same as what it was, say, in 2019 or something, when you could fly out, you could sit with 
uh, with somebody you're meeting for the first time and build that relationship. I think it takes longer. Uh, sometimes the comfort level just doesn't develop. There are the cultural barriers. There are the language barriers which come when, and especially gets uh, a bit accentuated when you're on a Zoom call. Um, so we have to navigate through all of that. But having said that, you know, despite all of this, we, we did manage to to look at a few deals closely. We did manage to go all the way uh, up to kind of final bidding stages. And what helped us was at least, uh, you know, the countries in which we were looking at those deals internally, there were consultants available, there were advisors available who could uh, go around, uh, you know, go to the sites and go and meet the management teams and sit down, etc. And there is that comfort level which can be developed with those advisors, etc. Because these are mostly global firms where we work with them in New York or London or any of those places. So that's how we've navigated. But to sum it all up, it's ideal. I, I don't think it's ideal. We just try to uh, make the best of the situation and, uh, and work on deals where we really think it's a good deal and we can get ourselves comfortable. But it's definitely uh, not the same as it would have been in 2019, uh, pre-COVID times, where things would have been much faster, if I can put it that way. Yeah. So I think those are some of the challenges that um, you know, we and our audience are, are going through. Um, in the US and um, elsewhere, we're seeing huge monetary stimulus, um, both through ultra low interest rates and um, uh, bond purchases by, by central banks. So there's a lot of liquidity in the market. Um, in addition, governments are talking about um, infrastructure bills, infrastructure spending, um, a lot of talk in the US, not much has been delivered. Um, Anita also mentioned the G7 um, initiative, uh, Build Back Better, um, as, a, as another uh, mechanism to ensure that our, our fiscal stimulus and our spending is pushing us in a green direction. Um, looking at the region, how do you see these macro factors uh, playing out to either create opportunities or maybe potential challenges for the deals over the next few years? I think you want to start that since you're sitting on the other side of the planet. You know. Yeah, look, um, I would say it's a combi, you know, it, it remains to be seen a lot of this money, uh, which is being pumped into the economy, obviously creates a lot of liquidity, which has to be deployed somewhere. And whilst most of these pledges are for build up internally in the countries, there is still a bit of liquidity which I think flows into different regions. And, you know, I think ch challenges, I can say one thing, it definitely props up asset prices. The valuations, uh, there's a volatility in the valuations, flows into the public market, links into the private markets, private asset valuations, etc. And there have been numerous cases where, you know, deals have fallen apart despite six, nine months of negotiations just because there has been a certain uh, public market benchmark, which has certainly risen by 10%, and hence that flows into the mindset of the private uh, seller. But I think on the positive side of things, that has also helped uh, a lot of companies raise debt at uh, historically low levels. And I think that is definitely a big advantage when it comes to this side of the world, which is able to tap uh, the most liquid on market in the world, which is the US dollar market at such competitive pricing. And that makes the projects economically viable for owners of these projects. So I think there is a positive and negative side of it. Um, but you know, I, I would also like to point out that in addition to the G7 and the US stimulus, etc., uh, there are some countries in Asia which have also pledged large amounts towards infrastructure. I mean, if you look at the National Infrastructure Plan of India, that's not small by any stretch of imagination and you can see activity uh you know uh, within that although it's slowed down due to covid whether it's the road sector or whether it's around the broader kind of uh, communication side of things so there are uh, there are these specific country plans also which have been uh, which have been put forward by countries in asia 
that, that, that was a fantastic <laughs> explanation of, of how you're seeing the market. Pratik, anything to add, Rohit? Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, uh, see, uh, there was always capital available based on my understanding uh, as far as uh, Asian infra is concerned, at least for in the last uh, 10 years. Enough liquidity was there. Uh, the question was whether, uh, you know, investors are uh, getting comfortable or uh, got comfortable in deploying their capital. But there was definitely an intention to deploy you know, money into this part of the world. Over the last two or three years, uh, a big shift that I have noticed is uh, some of these uh, investors who have been sitting on the sidelines or borderlines or trying to get comfortable with uh, the country, the sector, the promoter, uh, have decided to, you know, expedite their deployment into certain sectors and we touched upon those sectors uh, that could be ESG, you know, uh, digital infra, uh, hospitals, uh, warehouses, uh, sectors which were primarily impacted in some form or shape uh, due to COVID. So there has been a huge amount of capital uh, from this big institutional uh, Western European investors into some of these sectors in again certain markets, not the whole of Asia. Okay, super. Uh, Sigrid, I'm, I'm mindful of time. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, does anyone want to put Pratik or Rohit on the spot? So I'm just looking at the Q&A box here. I don't think we have received anything yet, uh, but I encourage our audience to please uh, do send some questions if you have any. Uh, Simon, we still have about 10 minutes uh, uh, or, or close to 10 minutes, I think, for you guys. Okay, so uh, feel free to carry on. Okay, okay. super. Um, focusing for a minute on ESG, um, how do the environmental, social and governance considerations factor into decision making and portfolio management for you guys? You know, how does it look today compared to um, a year or two ago. Um, listening to Anita at um, CDPQ, clearly um, there's a focus on this and it's pervasive. Um, what's the experience like over at Omas, Pratik? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's very different than what Anita said. I mean, ESG was always uh, an area of, uh, of uh, you know, you can call it as is one of the, uh, one of the I won't call it toolkits, but one of the parameters against which any sort of portfolio company asset management uh, approach was taken. I would say what has happened in the last couple of years is it's just strengthened. And there have been actually some hard dimensions put around the requirements in terms of whether it's carbon intensity or whether it's uh, inclusion and diversity or whether it's effectively how out of the out of the proper governance framework look like it's just strengthened over the last couple of years um so I, I would kind of classify it as it's it's always been there but it's just you know it's got more nuts and bolts around it and more dimensionalized in terms of what our targets are and how do we achieve them anything to add right here well not uh, much to add after what pratik mentioned uh see we are a japanese bank uh, we are we have been always very very concerned about environment and uh, ESG has become just more prevalent over the past uh, two to three years. Uh, whatever investment, uh, whatever evaluation that I'm currently doing, uh, ESG is an integral part of the overall assessment. Uh, it is a tricky subject uh, because uh, some of the uh, markets, some of the promoters uh, are not comfortable with ESG as a, as a concept. So there is a bit of education process that needs to happen. The benefit of having a ESG system uh, adopted not only as uh, you know at, at the investor level but also at the investee company level uh, so those challenges needs to be overcome but uh, we are happy to take that challenge you know, we are happy to go through the process of educating ourselves and also educating uh, the investee uh, companies uh, all of it uh, comes uh, with time energy and obviously money we are also happy to spend money to make sure that proper ESG processes are established and more importantly, followed. Uh, one final comment on this. Uh, typically, it's, it's easy to overcome it when it comes to the ESG aspect. You, know, you 
you know, start making promises to your stakeholders that this is what we are going to do when it comes to ESG. So my two cents would be to be very, very mindful and not overcome it and only, uh, you know, promise what can be delivered in emerging Asia, where the market is not very, very transparent. Noted, noted. Um, Rohit, I think you hit on a topic earlier that there's a lot of money that was on the sidelines that's now active and folks that um, were active want to be even more active. Um, a tremendous amount of uh, capital has been raised um, in infra funds. Um, those funds are also competing with strategics. Um, oil and gas companies looking to pivot, um, Japanese trading companies looking to pivot, um, as well as um, other um, companies in, 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 in the sector, particularly for, for energy transition. Um, beyond money, so, so, so beyond money, so you're in a competitive situation beyond money. What is it that, uh, for example, SNBC or um, OMAS looks to provide to investees, co-investors, um, other project stakeholders to add value to a project? You know, how do you seek to differentiate yourself? Okay. Uh, I... <clears throat> Let's talk about the investing companies. You know, so these days, investing companies are also very demanding and picky. You know. uh, they only want to get capital from, uh, or they, they would want smart capital, intelligent capital. You know. uh, what it entails is uh, being in a position to open new markets uh, for for the for the uh, investing companies, being in a position to provide uh, operational expertise, you know, in some form or shape. You know. Either you have that in-house or uh, you you uh, come up with a panel of uh, operating partners who would be able to provide uh, those expertise to, to the founders of your investing companies. You know. And uh, luckily, I'm part of a Japanese commercial bank, uh, which uh, uh, comes with its own set of distribution network. network. Uh, we have been around. Uh, we have been in Asia for the past so many years. I don't even know. Uh, pretty much uh, around in most of the emerging uh, countries in Asia. Uh, that itself uh, is something uh, which is seen as a value add that we can bring onto the system. I'll stop here and pass it to Pratik. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's definitely a, a competition between strategic sauce trading houses, quasi-strategics, etc. I think uh, the way we approach this is what we what we try to bring to the table is firstly uh, decades and decades of experience uh, investing in, in these sectors where uh, the investing companies, existing promoters, management teams can leverage off uh, a kind of a cross-geography, cross-functional, cross-asset category experience. Uh, where we bring that sort of, uh, you know, overlay into it. Then I think uh, the other thing is a, a long-term view on things where we are here for for the long-term growth of the company and uh, kind of a, a stable capital base which we can provide. So I think those are the things which uh, we, uh, you know, we try to position almost as, as the best partners. But, uh, you know, I can say it's not, it's not easy as well. It's, it's, uh, the promoters and uh, and the sellers and the investing companies are very picky because there is abundant capital and there is a lot of choice in the market. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I see. There's a question from the audience about uh, challenges in obtaining financing uh, on the basis of ESG. I think coal's been out for a long time. Um, I guess one thing on the bubble is is LNG, um, where a year ago. Folks were looking at LNG as a as a true bridge to um, greener renewables. Um, ADB came out uh, a few weeks ago saying no more um, LNG or gas financings, and that's kind of going to echo around the market for a while. Um, have you had any specific examples of challenges or any any challenges that that you see coming up? You have green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, brown hydrogen. You want to 
So we, uh, I wouldn't have any specific examples, Simon. I mean, the only thing we can say, I can say is that, uh, you know, we do have investments in Europe on the gas distribution side of things. And, uh, you know, so far we're not really seeing uh, any sort of liquidity issues, whether it's the bank market or the capital markets. But anecdotally, I do know that for coal, it's getting incrementally more difficult to get uh, get any sort of financing these days. Yeah, so for us, uh, LNG is still something that can be evaluated, uh, but it's slowly you know, uh, moving into a direction uh, where uh, it might fall into that, uh, you know, the gray area zone. You know, you're not sure whether it's something that uh, is uh, beneficial to the environment or whether it's not. You know. And it's going to happen very soon, very soon. Uh, but as of today, yes, we can we can evaluate. And uh, having said that, ESG component is going to be you know, uh, something that should be part of the overall investment thesis for the energy. Hydrogen, as I had said earlier, uh, it's it's not going to happen. Uh, happy to be corrected. Uh, it's not going to happen in uh, emerging Asia at least for the next three or four years. But we are closely monitoring, watching that space. Okay, uh, um, unless we have any further questions from the audience, uh, I'd like to thank our uh, panelists, uh, Rohit and Pratik. Uh, very interesting conversation and back to you, Singrid. All right, thank you so much, Simon. Uh, that was an excellent uh, conversation. Uh, thanks again, uh, Pratik and Rohit for joining uh, uh, this panel session. Uh, some takeaways, you know, growth will definitely be coming from this part of the world. And I think to make this happen, as you guys have actually correctly pointed out, uh, there has to be capital uh, that has to be invested in some of the things you mentioned, the digital infrastructure, solar energy, electric vehicles. Uh, many of these things are really quite needed in emerging markets uh, here in Asia. And uh, just, uh, I think, to quote what was cited by the Asian Development Bank, there is an infrastructure uh, gap uh, deficit uh, totaling $8 trillion US dollars, okay, over the next decade here in Asia Pacific. So it's quite a uh, substantial amount, just to put that in perspective, tons of opportunities that you guys can participate in. So thank you very much. Uh, great stuff. So for our final session uh, of our uh, program uh, for today, we have a fireside chat between two luminaries in our industry. Uh, Bruce Crane, who's Managing Director, Head of Infrastructure and Natural Resources for Asia Pacific at the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. And Mr. David Luboff, uh, who's Partner and Head of Asia Pacific Infrastructure at KKR. So without further ado, I would like to hand this over to both David and Bruce. Hello, Bruce. Wow, we got this to work. It's amazing. Are we on? I think we're on. All right, is there introduction? No, well. Let's just take it away. Good to see you again. So I think we have about 20 minutes. Um, I think I, I've got a couple interesting questions that hopefully the audience will find uh, compelling. But but before we get into that, KKR, obviously it's uh, a, a global institution that needs no introduction, but relatively new to the region. 
uh, when they hired you, I think the idea was um, to be able to put together a, a pool of capital and, and do what they've done successfully everywhere else here. Uh, obviously, recognizing the many challenges that, that come with investing in, in Asia, especially with a first time fund. How's it going? Um, it's actually going really well. Thank you, Bruce. Um, one thing I'd point out is um, KCAR has actually been in Asia in the alternates industry for many, many years with a very successful private equity franchise, which the firm is very well known for here in Asia. But beyond that, the firm have established credit strategies, real estate um, strategies, infra strategies, for example, now technology strategies. So whilst we were launching a first time Asia infrastructure fund, we did have the benefit of leveraging of the very strong um, presence and platform that KKR as a whole have across Asia. And I think that was a key competitive advantage. So it's been a, um, you know, it's been a really good start. Um, it's early days. We're very grateful to LPs for their support. Obviously, that's fundamental to raising a fund is the LP trust and support. Um, so that's um, that's been most pleasing. The team build out um, has gone really well. Um, and I think we're very fortunate, again, in terms of the timing of the team build out, most of it having occurred and having our team members on the ground in the regional centers pre-COVID. Um, and then investing um, has gone. We're very pleased with the investments that we've made. We've made six investments so far. We're very um, happy with the way they're performing. So it's been a great start. It's early days, um, but the platform has um, has really given us, I think, a leg up over the two, two and a half years since we, um, since certainly since I came on board. That's great. What, I mean, you mentioned having had early success, six investments. Um, we, it seems like we're in a bit of an inflection point between you hearing people talk about lower for longer, yet you're starting to see talks about inflation, rising interest rates. Do you feel that we're in an inflection point from a valuation perspective as well? And does that bode well for you guys? Have you, have you seen valuations at reasonable levels? Obviously, if you've done six deals, you've liked what you've seen, but are you are you also having struggles with some of the valuations that we're seeing or or do you not see that being an issue so much here in the region? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question, Bruce, and it you know, links to it is COVID, right? Like what has COVID done to valuations, which I know is something that um, we've spoken about before. And I think, I think the reality is it's just too soon to say, you know, as, um, as we know, these are not very liquid, deep markets. You know, there are exceptions. Some markets are deeper than others, some are liquid, but we don't have enough data points to comprehensively say, this is what has happened to pricing as a consequence of COVID. And I'll go into the macroeconomic um, variables in a moment. Um, anecdotally, uh, my observations um, were that there was a dip in pricing in 2020. The great unknown, how long would this last for? I think what we've seen is that as a general rule, infrastructure um, or certain certain has contracted infrastructure has performed as had hoped. And I think from a general investment community perspective, what I'm seeing and hearing is the resilience of infrastructure really has been highlighted. Obviously, there'll be exceptions. You'll have toll roads, you'll have airports, patronage based assets that um, obviously um, still are having challenges. But as a general rule, the asset class, I think, has stepped up and stood up. And as a consequence, I think more money continues to flow into infrastructure assets. There's greater demand for the assets. And anecdotally, we haven't seen those buying opportunities that we saw um, in the immediate aftermath of COVID in early 2020. So new sets of challenges. And then you go on to your correct, um, your very relevant question about lower for longer, lower for longer, inflation, what does this all mean? But I think as a general rule, you know, the textbook would tell us inflation is good for price setters. And infrastructure assets, as we know, by dint of their privileged market um, position, often have regulation on what they can charge. And the fallback is often that you can pass through, in, you can pass through um, inflation through your tariffs. And so the financial models will always tell us that inflation is a good thing for for infrastructure assets, those that are price setters. Um, I think that's right. I do think there's a lot of nuance that you have to be aware of there. Um, you know, for example, we often see regulated utilities where people will buy at a multiple of regulated asset value. What does that mean? How do you think about inflation that only applies to your regulated asset base? How do you think about your leverage on your assets? Um, in, interest rates often go up with inflation or vice versa. 
So, you know, there is, there are those impacts to consider. Um, the one thing I'd say is whilst I've been very positive on rising inflation, I've made the comments as to why it's positive. One of the things that we do spend a lot of time thinking about is we are investing in, in our fund, at least in a close ended 10 year structure. So we do have to always think about how do we exit. And in a rising inflation, rising interest rate environment, we need to be cognizant that cost of capital should increase as well. So you may have the cash flow benefit of higher revenues. Typically, we will hedge our debt or we'll have protection on higher interest rates. But what we need to spend time is what, how do we think about that terminal value? How do we think about that exit within our finite life? And because buyers cost of capital is at a certain level today, in a rising interest rate environment, we should expect cost of capital to generally rise. Equity premium needs to rise commensurately. So how do we price that um, exit? And we're spending a lot of time um, focusing on that aspect of the interest rate inflation curve. I would say again, Bruce, the thing that you know, I think we are more sensitive to is real interest rate increases. Again, because of this offset that we get through inflation on revenues from nominal interest rate increases. And do you see that as a concern um, to the underlying valuations of the assets or more to the economies that underpin some of the macro driving the valuations of those assets? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, I think, as you know, Bruce, Asia is such an enormous region and we are selective um, as to which regions this fund will invest in. And we'll be investing in regions where we're very confident in the local regulations, the local macroeconomics, the depth of market, the track record of getting money in and out of the countries, the ability to deal with some macroeconomic volatility. We're not saying that there will be huge amounts of macroeconomic volatility, but we generally want to invest in countries where a, you don't have as much volatility. When you do have volatility, it's handled well and appropriately. And an example is always um, the currency element of high inflation. What does that do to your US dollar returns? If you can pass on inflation through your tariffs, we're feeling better about that risk. In terms of the asset level risk, I think it just comes down to specific due diligence. And that's been the interesting thing. You know, COVID has been really challenging on due diligence in certain assets. Like, How do you genuinely diligence an airport in this environment? It's really hard in the short term. No one knows when traffic is going to bounce back. So we found that element to be super difficult in terms of how do we diligence and make short term assumptions. I think over the medium term, because privileged assets will obviously have more conviction. The flip side is we've seen contracted assets really perform. And when we think about how they have stood up to such a severe stress, and still maintain their cash flow profiles. Well, that's a great testament to those assets. And when we're doing due diligence and we look back at how they've performed over the last 16, 18 months, that gives us confidence to go forward. But your points are an incredibly important point. You know, looking forward, we are, on, we are at a point where we have been in a falling interest rate environment for a very long time. And certainly the financial markets are saying that is going to change. And we would be remiss as investors not to incorporate that in our thinking. And our planning. That's that's, that's helpful. You you mentioned um, you mentioned currencies uh, in that response. I think one of the one of the unique challenges to Asia is is for any institutional investor, be it a fund, direct, etc. Uh, you know, you, you people are here for for that true pan Asian exposure, the diversity, the DM, the M, etc. Are but the issue is you're dealing with anywhere from you know, 10 to 15 currencies, depending on how broad your strategy is. Very different from some of our global infra fund peers who might be dealing with a small basket of much more stable currencies. How do you guys think about currencies as you look across some of these very different countries? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, it's, it's, again, you need, we need to, firstly, we hedge. Let me simply say that my own personal thinking has evolved over time on this point, we hedge. And the good news is, currency markets, hedging markets have definitely become more liquid, liquid over the last few years. And you can get, um, you know, medium term hedges, which gives you the appropriate protection. So that's number one. Um, how do we think about it? Well, we need to price it. Um, you know, hedging costs are expensive in certain locations that needs to be factored in. So certainly in terms of when we even present our returns and when we compare and contrast opportunities in India to Australia to Korea, we standardize and bring things back to to US dollars, taking into account the hedging costs. Um, 
we will then look at other things such as what is the inflation again coming back to the prior topic we have seen that in a high inflation environment currencies generally tend to fall relative to the us dollar um, or putting another way how do we get protection we need to make sure we can pass on inflation cash uh, inflation growth through our assets so um, you know a number of ways of looking at currency definitely um, you know needs to be incorporated in asian strategy given the multitude of currencies and frankly we should acknowledge a lot of these currencies have been quite volatile um, historically yeah and we'll and we'll probably continue to be so okay enough with the 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 macro economic theory questions let's talk about people um, you mentioned earlier that that uh, the KKR has had offices in the region I think one of the other challenges when you when you come to a place like Asia and uh, obviously, as, as a direct investor, teachers, we've made a, a commitment to Singapore. We've opened our office here in Singapore. We use that as a beachhead to invest throughout the region. The 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 kind of the flip side of that is is more the the fund approach, where you are using localized beachheads that might be offices that originally been set up from a from a private equity perspective or a real estate perspective, but but you have the benefit of being able to have feet on the ground how, how do you guys think about that when you think about some of the the core countries that form part of the strategy for the region i think it's fundamental it really is um you know infrastructures i, I used this expression earlier today it's a slow burn uh, you know you, you really are relying on long-term privileged cash flows you really have to understand the local environment your social license to operate and it's really hard to do that from afar and the best way to do it is to have um, experienced qualified executives on the ground who really understand who your partners are what is the government's view of your license to operate what is society's view of your license to operate so incredibly important um, it always has been important and frankly to, over the last 18 months it's even more important because i don't think we would not not i don't think we would not have made these investments had we not have people on the ground we were not able to obviously fly in, fly out. So I do think there was a bit of luck in terms of the timing of our team build out. We had the key centers um, fully resourced up. We continued to you know, develop our team. We continue to um, augment with um, talented individuals. But the, you know, the core of the team slotted into the various KKR offices around the region, which we're very grateful for prior to COVID. So when we did have this momentarily moment this short lapse in pricing the guys were on the ground they were able to be nimble and execute so from your perspective covid obviously with all its other issues from from a from a deal execution perspective having those people on the ground proved virtuous uh and that their ability to continue to execute locally even though you were here in singapore not necessarily able to travel yeah having guys on the ground um what but was but always will in, in my humble opinion remain a key competitive advantage as the as the asset class gets more and more mature and we are seeing more competition it's you know it's fantastic that you're building such a great team in the region we're seeing others coming into the region these are all very sensible smart strategic lp so uh, investors so we need to recognize that more capital is coming in and this is smart sophisticated capital what does that mean for the asset class? How do we think about exits? What does it mean for pricing? All of that does need to be captured in our thinking. I would say, Bruce, one of the observations I've made is um, the, you know, we talk about what I've just highlighted, the demand for infrastructure. We're equally seeing a step up in supply in terms of institutional style transactions, bigger transactions, private sector led, government led privatizations. The Asian infrastructure market, and again, you know, it's a loose term because of such an enormous region. There are nuances and differences between countries, but the market as a whole has certainly developed whereby you can accommodate these larger pools of capital that are coming in and, you know, mobilizing and preparing for Asian infrastructure opportunities. That's great. So I think we have time for, for one last question. This will be a bit of a, of a catch all. Um, you've been investing in the region and in infrastructure for, for many, many years and thus have seen cycles and good things and bad things. Maybe just thinking back over the last 10 years, what are some of the key learnings from some of those investments, both good and bad, uh, that, you, that you use today? 
I think the un, the importance of really partnership, understanding, you know, very often in Asian infrastructure, in infrastructure globally, frankly, you know, there's a huge benefit of investing with local parties. And often you have to um, from a regulatory perspective. And I think really understanding your partner, getting to know them. Uh, Asia is a relationship based market. Um, and I think that to me is so fundamental, which again comes back to the benefit of having an experienced team on the ground that can form trusted relationships with local counterparts. So I'd say that's one. Um, I would say, you know, what I've observed in Asia, I'm certainly at least in patronage based assets, and this is anecdotal, but um, as an industry, I think often assets may have underperformed their investment cases in the short term, but overperformed in the medium term. And I think that's the breakout potential um, that Asia does present, which is why I think it's such an exciting region. Um, you've just got this massive region that's growing so quickly. Um, you've got the diversity of assets. Not every country has every sector open for investment, but there is still enough there to build a very cohesive um, portfolio of investments. Um, and you know the underpinning of positive macroeconomic growth the demography dividend that people speak about in Asia is incredibly exciting. So, um, you know, personally, I'm very bullish Asian infrastructure. I've obviously pivoted my career appropriately and accordingly, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to work in the sector. Well, thanks a lot. And congratulations again for, for a great start um, with KKR and, and their first infra fund here. Uh, I'm sure you'll have many years of success. So I think with that, we'll open it up um, to questions. I'm, I'm sure there's a, a very long burning list of, of questions for you. Although I don't think I see any posted. Bruce, can I ask you a question? Okay, nope. Sorry. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Um, you know, you two are a very experienced invest global infrastructure investor would love to hear your perspectives on the Asia infrastructure opportunity. How do you compare it to other markets, which I know you're, um, you're very familiar with as well? Yeah, like I, 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 it's an interesting question. I, I think everyone historically that has moved to Asia in the last five, 10 years and infrastructure has probably only been in the last two or three years of that. Um, it's a lot of institutional capital that is looking for growth uh, in addition to where, you know, as a somewhat as a, as a result of the lower for longer, somewhat as a result of the, of the lack of opportunities. I mean, if you think about the Canadian pensions, it, 10 years ago, they were investing in, in Canada, maybe a little bit in the US, maybe a little bit in the UK. Uh, and here, you know, five to 10 years later, they're, they're, they're global. Um, Again, some of that is is better returns. Uh, some of that is is just more opportunities. So I, I, you know, so I, I think the region is continuing to get institutionalized and professionalized, and that that comes from opportunities that are that are better marketed by advisors, better understood by lawyers. That's you're you're seeing government starting to become better equipped to deal with with you know institutional capitalist partners you're seeing local partners starting to be become <clears throat> better equipped to understand what what good governance looks like and so i think it's a journey for the region that will continue and and as part of that you know those good deals that that we all hope to be able to um you know to invest in on behalf of our stakeholders will become harder and harder to find uh and you know it'll follow the way of the, the rest of the world but i think that ultimately that's a good thing for the region and you know we all hope that what that means is many of these emerging economies become developed infrastructure as 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 not just an asset class but as an actual piece of concrete or whatever it is uh ultimately is is a better asset for the user because that's you know i think that's an important thing that that sometimes gets forgotten uh, in, in these in these economies, and look, if we can be part of that, that's uh, that's that's a, that's a great thing for everyone. All right, thanks, Bruce. That's so I think there, I, I see some questions, but I don't know if I'm supposed to read them or someone else will read them. I can read them. It's okay, okay. Bruce. <laughs> great, great, thanks. So, so, so there is one question. Uh, there's a lot of global PE firms that are investing in in, in the Indian office market. 
what is KKR's outlook for this segment in India and investment prospects? I'll give you my perspective. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I love the Indian market. I think it's um, it's tremendously exciting. We've made a number of investments in India. Um, I think um, the infrastructure market is a very attractive one. It has attracted a lot of um, foreign capital, um, a lot of um, um, GPs, a lot of Canadian pension funds have gone direct in a variety of sectors. Um, I think the debt markets are um, sophisticated and accommodative. So, um, you know, I think the backdrop is super positive. And then you've got you know, the exciting macroeconomic demography, demography dividends that we're all fully aware of. So a great market, a market that's been tested um, through a number of cycles um, and a market that I personally um, I'm very attracted to, but a lot of our um, partners who've come into our fund equally are happy to lean into. And any thoughts, uh, Bruce, uh, before uh, we end with one last question here? I think maybe David before uh, Bruce can chime in here. What is the KKR's target, uh, uh, IRR tar target after a five-year holding period? Was that a question to Bruce? <laughs> Oh, I mean, Bruce. Sorry, sorry, Bruce. It's for Bruce. Oh, I sorry. I, 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 I both of you. No, no. I think it was. I think you said to David. But what was I, it, what was the question? So what the would be what would be the target? Uh, I guess both of you uh, uh, target IRR after a five-year holding period. Well, David's I know is very high. Must be very high. <laughs> uh, no, I like. I think it's hard. Um, I assume you're talking about from just a broader Asia perspective, not, right. not a country. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, you know, for us, we, you know, we define the region as Asia Pac. So you, you're, mm -hmm. you're, it's a very broad region from very developed to very, you know, emerging uh, economies and thus a, a wide range of, of return. So right. um, it, it's impossible to kind of give you a generic return. Uh, because in some markets we're going to look for stable, very stable returns, similar to what we're getting in our in our core uh, Western markets, uh, mm -hmm. and in others we're going to be looking for that growth um, that we don't get. So I'd say, uh, you know, in 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 a broad range in in U.S. dollar returns, I I bet you you'd see anywhere from kind of high single digits to mid teens would be mm. would be the kind of the, the the range right um and then obviously on a on a country by country perspective that could change okay that could vary how about you david um, i agree with bruce okay, it's very difficult to give um you know a sing firstly even five years um secret, you know some of these assets you want to hold for a long amount of time i i agree with the way bruce has framed it um you know we look at the you know what's the right time to sell um when is it you know we are seeing an emerging market when can we put in place the enhancements we want to for the asset what is the overall fund return you know you are going to get a lower return for the same asset in the, in the market like australia relative to a market such as india which we've discussed so how do we price the differential put it all together and get a great um overall fund return all right, so, so let me just add, uh, have like one last question for you guys. Uh, I know we're running out of time, but uh, both of you mentioned that we're seeing a better partnership between the private and the public sector when it comes to a lot of these infrastructure projects. If there is one thing that you'd like to see, you know, working with the government, uh, we in April, we work with them. Is there any wish list? One, if you can just cite one, okay, that you think is very critical, to make sure that this path towards supporting infrastructure projects continue, you know, particularly in many of these emerging markets where it's greatly needed. Yeah, I'll kick off. If, if it's to governments, I would say, you know, when governments talk about privatizing assets, you know, it's just as an example, just one element of government policy. A huge amount of work goes into it from the private sector participant, as it goes in from the government side. Time, cost, money, we understand why these need to be long processes, consultants and so on. And I think private sector will always mobilize because of the demand for infrastructure assets when there is a timetable and a process that we are comfortable with and that we believe will happen. 
And I think sometimes when that con constantly changes, when it does change, I think private sector, there's a lot of opportunities in the Asian region, will look for other processes where we're confident that the mobilization costs and effort and time and resources are worth it. So it's more just the conviction on a pipeline of projects that are speak, spoken about that they will happen in a reasonable time frame. Okay, thank you. Yeah, your, your thoughts, Boots? Um, yeah, it, it, it's, look, I think it's hard to, to, to pin any one thing. I mean, I, I think one of the interesting things about capital like ours uh, and a region like this um is uh is is the difficulty of being involved in the in the construction or the or the creation of infrastructure i mean we're, we're generally you know we, we 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 generally prefer or specialize or are best in in buying infrastructure and being part of the recycling capital story versus versus building or funding the construction of infrastructure that's just generally not our expertise and that that issue is or those difficulties are, are magnified in many of the countries that unfortunately are the ones that most in need of that infrastructure being built uh, and so the ability to narrow that gap so that potentially we can we can participate more in the actual building of the infrastructure versus just the recycling of the capital would be great and I, I don't know exactly how you do that but it obviously takes a lot of government support and right. um, different programs to be able to 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 give investors like us the, the confidence because it's a very different risk profile right, right, right. okay so uh, any just last words before we wrap these up thoughts um, Bruce or David just anything you want to share with our audience I'll let Bruce uh, yeah, no, nothing, nothing more to share. <laughs> okay. So, I'll right. just say thank you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. Um, it's a great topic. Um, yeah. It's a really exciting region. Um, so thank you for um, your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, David and Bruce. And completely agree. You know, we're going to have a series of uh, uh, webinars and even physical events hopefully very soon, uh, particularly in infrastructure. This is one area, you know, that uh, we believe, you know, in Asia Pacific uh, is uh, there's a lack of information, but there's a ton of opportunities that people are not aware of. Okay, so uh, we are so privileged to have you both. You are the industry heavyweights when it comes to this area. So thank you for your thoughts and time. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us. It has been uh, an excellent program over the last two days. And so I hope everyone enjoyed the program. And uh, the recording of the session uh, will be available right after this. In fact, if you have access to our YouTube channel, you can view them there and also on the website. So we'll see you guys again. Thank you. Have a great afternoon and stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you bye -bye. all.